Welcome to BizHack Live, our weekly webinar series where we talk about small business marketing and how a small business can survive and thrive despite the pandemic. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy and the host of BizHack Live. And today we have just an extraordinary session. We brought together five of the top small business support organizations in South Florida, uh, the Idea Center at Miami-Dade College, Ascend Us, uh, the SBDC, the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Program, and Miami Bayside Foundation. These are organizations that are solely dedicated at helping small businesses, micro enterprises, and entrepreneurs survive and thrive in the challenging econ economic situation. They provide access to capital, they provide technical support, they provide training, they provide free and low cost mentorship, uh, and they provide access to the best knowledge and best practices that are really required to help a small business survive and thrive in today's economy. And these are, are all organizations that have been around, many of them for, for decades, uh, and their, their importance has never been greater than during the past year uh, where, uh, of COVID. Um, I wanna uh, recognize the organizations that make BizHack Live possible, particularly the South Florida Integrated Marketing Association who um, has uh, promoted this to their audiences, Miami Marketers, uh, CIC, the co-working space in Midtown Miami, the American Marketing Association, South Florida chapter, and Creation Station based in Fort Lauderdale. I wanna uh, welcome our amazing panelists and invite each of them to uh, do a quick introduction of themselves and their organizations, starting with Fabiana. Welcome, Fabiana. Hey, good morning to all. Well, my name is Fabiana Estrada. I'm the director of lending for the Southeast region for Ascendus, form, formerly Acción. Uh, we have been doing business in the United States since 1991. We are a long time organization that our mission is to provide access to capital and financial education. Um, one of the main reasons why we had been very successful and for many years we had been working close to entrepreneurs here in Florida specifically, it was because we provide a one-on-one -on -one. and our process in reference of lending is really very fast. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, great job. Gustavo Grande from uh, the Idea Center at Miami Dade College, welcome. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Lilia. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gustavo Grande, Program Director at the Idea Center of Miami Dade College. We are basically the hub of innovation and entrepreneurship for Miami Dade College, and we also support the community. And all of those that are curious to develop their ideas, taking them off the ground and go through the process of idea to concept to prototype to go to market and scalability. Thank you, Dan. Beautiful. And, uh, you know, the Idea Center at Miami Dade College holds a really special place in my heart because seven years ago, I started teaching a course there. Uh, it was the first small business digital marketing course at Miami Dade College's history uh, dedicated to specifically helping small businesses. And that course, which was called Market Hack, uh, grew and grew and eventually became what is today BizHack. So in many ways, I really was incubated and had my start at the Idea Center and uh, Gustavo, I'm so grateful to you and to that organization for helping launch my business and, and, and thank you. Thank you Dan for the support as well and the collaboration. Michael Selinger, uh, who is with Miami Bayside Foundation, welcome. Gotta turn your mic on. Uh, thank you, Dan. Uh, so Miami Bayside Foundation empowers small businesses run by minorities and women in Miami-Dade County. Uh, we do that three ways. We have a future workforce development program. We effectively grants and scholarships for high school students in marginalized communities. Um, for small businesses, we have a technical assistance program. We do, uh, we have a uh, how to Run Your Business 101, which is a great starter. We then feed people into places like Idea Center or to 10,000 businesses, which you'll hear about in a minute. Um, we also do deep dives in certain subjects. We have a financial literacy coming up, for instance, in May. And then our loan program, we do loans up to $150,000 at 6% uh, interest uh, to support the community. Thank you, Dan, for having us. Um, Michael, I, I've always been just such an admirer of Miami Bayside and the innovation 
uh, and the growth that you guys have seen. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Dan, for the kind words. Now, one of my favorite participants is Pamela Fuentes. And uh, the reason why is because um, I've been an instructor in the Goldman Sachs program, which is housed at the Idea Center at Miami-Dade College, where they share, they share a floor with them uh, for years. But I always would introduce myself as a future 10KSB alumni. Uh, I was part of the last cohort that was in person before COVID, graduating in December uh, of 20. 19, and it's with special pride uh, that I uh, welcome you, Pamela, the head of the Miami, Miami's 10KSB program uh, as an alumnus of that program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you for the invitation uh, to join you today. Um, always very happy to support an alumni of our program and certainly very happy to join uh, such a wonderful panel. Um, I have the pleasure to work with each one of, of, of each one of our panelists very closely. And um, you know, our commitment at the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program is to be uh, the growth accelerator, a program that embraces uh, and helps small businesses scale and grow. Uh, we are a part of a national program. We are one of 20 sites across the United States. And Miami-Dade College is uh, the official academic partner of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. Uh, we have been here since 2013 and have helped more than 600 uh, small businesses in our community succeed. Well, many of yours, uh, such as yours, Dan's, and, and so many others. So a pleasure to join everyone today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, welcome, Brian Van Hook of the SBDC. Uh, the Small Business Development Council, which is a federally funded but locally organized uh, operation. Uh, and Brian, I I've had the pleasure to work with you and with Michael on, on some training programs. And you guys just do amazing work uh, supporting thousands of small businesses with technical support, mentorship, and other services. It's great to have you here. Thanks. And no pressure. I'm the closer. So no pressure on me after following the distinguished uh, panelists. But um, thanks again to um, Dan for the opportunity to be on the panel. Um, as he mentioned, I'm the regional director of the Florida Small Business Development Center at FIU. We're under the College of Business. We're not professors. We don't do research. We have the awesome job to be out in the community and help businesses grow. We serve businesses in Miami-Dade County and also the Keys. Um, and what we always say is um, we're kind of our job is to grow your business. Um, like a lot of the other folks on here, we're focused on business growth. Um, but we do focus heavily on access to capital financial management. Um, and I'm really proud last year that we have normally 17 consultants um, that assist businesses. We did add 10 additional um, consultants um, to basically keep up with the demand. But in a normal year, we help about 1,000 businesses. Last year, we helped 2,200 businesses. And also in a normal year, we help businesses get about 35 to 40 million in capital. And last year, we did 95 million in capital. So um, I just want to thank the panelists and also kind of sh shout out to my team because how I could we couldn't do it without such a great team. So just thanks thanks to Dan for the opportunity. Look forward to the discussion. Yeah, absolutely. Well, th this is a great segue, and I'll start with you, Brian. How have you? And this is a question for all of you, and I would just invite you to answer quickly. Um, how have you seen the needs of small businesses shift during COVID? Um, in other words, if we look at pre-COVID and then post-COVID, what are some key differences in terms of what small businesses need? And feel free to just talk about one aspect of the change. Between the five of you, I, we'll get a really comprehensive view of, the, of how small businesses are being impacted. And I'll start with you, Brian. I was going to say, uh, for me, our center has been around since 2014. I've never seen as many businesses seeking business strategy, operations, HR, and then also financial management help. And I think that's a, a bad thing because of the pandemic, but I think it's also a really good thing for the businesses to be stronger coming out of the pandemic. And obviously a lot of the businesses, they needed to pivot. They needed to just shift their business model. They needed to basically deal with HR issues related to the pandemic in terms of staffing down or covering other duties within the um, business that you know they had to um, downsize. And then I think also just businesses, um, because they were seeking some capital from Fabiana, from Michael, from SBA, they really needed to get a handle on their finances. And so I, th I think we've seen a lot of businesses focused on those um, service areas in addition to access to capital. 
Um, and so, but I think it is a good thing long-term for those businesses because that's gonna make their business a lot stronger if they're focusing on those areas. Yeah, the, the three areas of technical assistance I tend to see a lot of small businesses need is HR, marketing, and cap access to capital and financials. Um, speaking of access to capital, first Fabiana, then Michael, how have you guys seen Fabiana uh, send us uh, a change in the access to capital needs and frankly also the willingness to lend? Yes, absolutely. There is um, definitely something that we have to um, probably let our entrepreneurs know that it's not only that you have to have an amazing credit or probably uh, amazing financial information. Uh, with Michael, we participate with a program, uh, a local program in Miami that we, we are um, asking for the entrepreneur for the local business tax. Even the fact that it could be surprisingly, uh, some of them, they, we are not aware that they need that type of information in order to be in operation. So it's not only one piece of uh, advice that we need to provide to the business owner. It's credit, it's cash flow. Uh, individuals that they do not realize what type of business entity they have. Why I have a sole proprietor? Why I shouldn't be having a corporation? Why I have a, an S corporation? So all are questions that they are opening doors to have a better conversation with accountant, with legal, with marketing as well, because that's something that is very important in the life of the entrepreneurs. So I guess that most of our entrepreneurs, they realize that it's not only one factor that is important to take care of, just to do a better service or a better food, a better cake. No, everything has to be controlled by the business owner. It's not right now, oh, my accountant has that information. Oh, I know that um, my legal has that contract. You have to know your business in order to succeed. Michael, same question for you. How have you noticed the capital needs uh, have changed? Well, everybody was shut down for you know at least a month and a half. And if you're in the food business, much longer. So everybody needed working capital to survive, which was why the RISE program that Fabiana and I put together with a couple of other CDFIs was so successful. I mean, we put out $19 million and helped over almost 900 small businesses with loans up to $30,000. So there, there is significant demand out there. Uh, the small businesses were the ones that were most affected because they don't have the uh, wherewithal of the time to pull the papers that, and documents together that Fabi is referring to, which is why groups like the SBDC were helpful in helping uh, motivate or, or bring those businesses up to where they need to be so that they could access capital. Yeah, the financial readiness and access to capital are, are intertwined. And one of the things that this also requires is by going through these application processes, a lot of them are regularizing and up, upgrading their practices. Um, when That's you need right. to borrow That's money from a bank, you're going to get scrutinized. Right. That's exactly what Fabiana was referring to when she said, you know, a good chunk of the businesses we saw didn't even have a BTR. So that was a requirement that we made that we're yeah. getting the loan. It was county, it was federal monies through the county. I think the other interesting thing about COVID, as, as we look back, is um, it was an opportunity, as I think Brian mentioned, for everybody to pivot. And his, typically, a small business is always going to get affected by change, pivot. They need to be able to pivot. But when change happens to you as a small business, you take it personally. But I think in this environment where everybody was being affected, people didn't take the pivot change, uh, the, the, cha the change as personally, and therefore they were more uh, willing to pivot. And I felt like the pivots were much more aggressive, much more uh, timely, and, and were getting done rather than people crying in their beer first and then doing something about it. I think that's a great segue to Gustavo and Pamela. So Gustavo and Pamela work with businesses from startup all the way to scale up. Um, Gustavo tends, uh, often works with smaller, uh, and, and more uh, start starting up businesses, their, their startup, pro their, uh, scale up program tends to deal with businesses 150 K and below, and they have other programs. Whereas the 10 KSB program tends to be 150 K and above in annual revenue. So let's start with Gustavo. What have you seen in the entrepreneurs and the startup businesses that are taking the leap to start a business? during uh, a global economic downturn and a pandemic. Totally. And I think if something the pandemic made more relevant than before was the adoption of the digital agenda, 
understanding that now more than ever, in order to start a business or grow your business or manage your business, you need to have access to technologies like the one we're using today. In the past, we will have a physical event and now we're doing this through Zoom. Um, companies, even restaurants, need, need to understand the importance of data, of how are they managing their tickets, the cost of their operations, and where are the business coming from. Um, and other industries have been needing to communicate with the team members in capacities like this one. So how to run a, a meeting in Zoom or how to be able to manage efficiently their operations using technology and business uh, intelligence, it has been one of the main components of business nowadays, how they get their people, they train their people in order to be more savvy on how to use these technologies in order to support their operations, but also their growth. It's one of the key elements that entrepreneurs are more aware on how to use. And that also translates in the way they do marketing as well. So now everybody needs, because everybody's on the computer or in the phone, now everybody is getting more savvy on how to use their digital marketing strategies as well. You know, it's interesting, Pamela, thank you, Gustavo. Pamela, I've actually seen a lot more Goldman Sachs graduates enroll in our training programs around digital marketing and digital lead generation. And many of those have been B2B businesses and B2G businesses, businesses that do business with other businesses or companies and businesses that do business with the government. And what I've observed is that a lot of these companies, their normal marketing channels were shut down you know, they traditionally went to trade shows, conferences, um, you know, the, the local chamber of commerce. Uh, they did a lot of in-person sales and all of those channels like overnight were suddenly shut down and they needed to figure out how do I communicate with my ideal customer online? And they've had to upskill and really shift their marketing. Uh, I'm interested in your perspective from the applicant pool that you're getting and the needs uh, that you're seeing that have shifted from the uh, and, and how that's pressing on the curriculum that you're able to provide. Thank you. Well, I think that um, what we're seeing is much of what has been discussed. Um, certainly, I think small businesses have, uh, have, have learned to, number one, embrace technology because they just absolutely had to. Um, you know, there wasn't much like all of us. We didn't have the benefit of face-to-face uh, -face meetings, of traveling to visit your clients, of having your uh, clients come to your respective business or the so on. So certainly I think small businesses uh, and certainly our community, which is why you may be attracting some of our alumni is because everyone has said, oh my gosh, uh, we have to have an online presence. We have to have a digital presence. So certainly the embrace of technology and the investment uh, that comes with that is something that's been obvious to small business owners across the board. Um, and number one. Number two, I also think that small business owners have realized that this is an opportunity to reassess how they engage uh, and negotiate. It's the power of negotiation, whether that's dealing with a banking institution, whether that's dealing with a foundation that has grants, uh, whether that's dealing with um, their landlord or, or with their respective you know, uh, legal team or fiscal team, whatever the case may be. I think small business entrepreneurs have really um, have really, you know, captured the opportunity that has existed within this time frame to really say, you know what, the power is within me, uh, within our company to reassess and to renegotiate, um, you know, what's important, whether that's the next new project or more favorable payment terms, whatever the case may be. So I think that's what we've seen. Now, I'm very encouraged. Um, our community of 10,000 small businesses, um, we have companies that come from all of our target industries. And I think many of them have been very successful uh, in embracing not only the takeaway, if you will, of the uh, 10,000 small business um, community, but they've been very successful at adapting. Um, and what I've seen is a lot of creativity. Mm -hmm. We've had companies that, um, a fashion designer, for example, she all she had was her fashion designs and so on and so forth. She started developing renewable textiles textiles that are environmentally friendly and that are eco-friendly. And now she is, you know, thriving. Uh, she's finding this opportunity to really talk about and selling her product in this space. Um, and so I've seen a lot of creativity and I'm just, I'm very encouraged by both uh, our alumni community and those that, that contact us to find out more. Yeah, you know, a lot of businesses have 
been forced essentially to innovate and improve. And when things loosen up and some of the more traditional opportunities reemerge, they actually are positioned for quite significant growth, I think, because they have a much more you know, digitally ready 21st century product and marketing approach, but they also have the tried and true you know, channels and tried and true uh, products that um, are going to return, especially, especially in those industries like travel and tourism uh, that have been uh, so impacted. W the industries that um, rely on kind of in-person, this includes also storefronts such as restaurants and fitness studios are, from my seat, ones that have been impacted the most. And I wanted to start with you, Brian. From an industry perspective, um, what are some of the business types that have been hardest hit? The ones where they're like, I'm in trouble. And, and you sort of are like, I don't know how, to, it's like, I'm not quite sure how to help you. You know what, when everything was shut down and you were running a restaurant, it was just like, hang on, just hang on. Uh, like there's, there's not a lot of, you know, advice to be given um, for certain industries or if you're in the cruise industry, um, how, what are some of the industries that you've seen that have been the most challenging to help? Well, I would say um, you kind of hit the main ones that have kind of got a lot of the focus, which was obviously retail, restaurants, hospitality. Um, the one that we've seen a big impact related to was professional services. So if you're talking about like dentists and things like that, you know, um, chiropractors, anything that people had to go in person. And so we've seen a lot of those businesses. And if you think about it, a lot of those are family owned businesses, like really small businesses, you know, not multi-million dollar ones. An example I can give you is we have a really great client that's in North Miami Beach and it's a family owned dentist. Um, it was started by husband and wife. They started in the nineties, they had 14 employees. And basically overnight, they don't have people coming in to get their teeth checked out. I think that's bad for them because um, they're not getting checked on, but they basically kind of struggled immediately um, instead of just, they were just doing like emergency like things, like somebody cracked a tooth or something like that. And they had to immediately kind of like tighten their belt. They did have to like downsize their employees um, and then kind of went through, as we say, the alphabet soup, PPP, Idle. Um, I don't know if they got a RISE fund um, uh, loan, but basically they were able to get a lot of the programs and they added back 12 of the 14 um, employees that they had, and then they're a little bit tighter, a little bit leaner. And one of the biggest things that they did was they did a, a ba very basic marketing video for their clients to show the safety protocols that they do when they come in the office. They check your temperature, everybody's wearing a mask, you know, all the different things. We actually got them featured on CBS4, and the reporter kept asking me when he was doing my interview, did you help him with the marketing video? And I was like, we helped him with a lot of stuff, man, but we didn't help him with the marketing video. That's all them. They did that. Um, and I, so I think that's a really good example. And you got to think about those, like, it, like I said, it's a, a husband and wife running the business and they employ 14 people, you know, that has a big impact on the economy when you factor that up. So I think those are a lot of the businesses that we've been really trying to help in addition to restaurants, retail, hospitality, you know, all the other ones. Also government contractors was one too, because a lot of the projects stopped immediately. That's how I knew that the pandemic was going to really hit the whole economy when government contractors started saying, hey, jobs are slowing down, things are on hold. On hold. Um, so I would kind of say that's from our perspective. Fabiana, I'm going to ask you the same question, but the opposite, which is, are there any industries that have really thrived that you've seen grow and take uh, the COVID and the lockdown as a huge opportunity for growth? Well, um, we had been working with one company that um, they provide um, technical assistance and, you know, maintenance on uh, AC. And they were the ones that they were setting the AC, um, you know, system for the COVID um, places where you could get tests or where you could get, you know, information about how to get your vaccine and everything. So some industries, they were cleaning companies. At the very beginning, all the companies that they were doing the cleaning, people they were afraid of how I'm going to be doing that until all of us would receive the education that if we sanitize a place and we could everything in good shape. So those are the reason that education at all level is very important. Right now, cleaning companies, they are, they are really very on high performance. Everything that is related to, we are in Florida, so AC, we need always um, a technician. Landscaping, because everybody wants to keep, you know, they are clean and uh, everything uh, in place. So like we are always saying the same, there's opportunity. 
our network is always very important as well. So if we educate our customer as a business owner, we are going to be very sure that we are going to improve our numbers, our cash flow, and our clientele as well. You know, home services, which the air conditioning is a big part of, has just been booming. Uh, and we have seen, you know, pest control companies, um, folks who do outdoor construction to help people build out their backyards, pool installation, uh, people who sell, um, like everybody on my block now has uh, trampolines. You know, mm -hmm. there have definitely been companies... True. Any company that helps sort of make your home more of a sanctuary seems to have done very well. And I think a lot of the money that might have been spent for those who have it on travel uh, has been redirected to making their home a more comfortable place. Exactly. Michael, same question. Are there any other folks who you've seen maybe even surprisingly thriving during this? I, I think, as I said earlier, those that, that jumped quickly and pivoted were able to survive. And that's really what it boiled down to is not crying in your beer and, and realizing that it's happening to everybody. And how do I, how do I, what do I need to do? And it was doing things like embracing technology, doing more online sales, more online marketing, um, putting up quickly the PPP or PPE, uh, I guess it is, a, um, whatever you need to do to make yourself, your space safe uh, and just adapting that way. Did you see, Michael, like um, a particular quality in the entrepreneurs that were faster to pivot, maybe a little bit more resilient despite the challenges? Did you, did you notice like what kind of entrepreneur tends to be the one that pivots the fastest in a situation like this? I, I'm not sure I understand the nature of the question because I think an entrepreneur by, by very nature should be willing, ready to pivot. Um, if you're not and you're not up for the the challenges of the roller coaster being a, a, an entrepreneur and the changes that, that come with it and challenges, uh, then I think some of those people probably got weeded out. Yeah, I understood. Gustavo, so same question to you. Have you seen any difference in the type of entrepreneur that's attracted to starting a business during a time like this? And um, what kind of psychographic or personality seems to do best despite the challenging times? Totally, and I think this is true in any of our space, which is those that are open to feedback. Um, so it's not just like, oh, um, I just want money for working capital, but they're open to get feedback in terms of how can I adapt, how can I pivot, and can you give me, uh, can you criticize, give me constructive criticism? And they're also open to learn. So they, they don't think that they know everything because they know that this situation is different. So because the situation is different, they have to do something different. Uh, and there are, it doesn't matter how many years of experience they have in their business. They can have 20 years of experience, but this situation has demanded something different from them. Um, and because of that, they are open to learn uh, and they know that they have that capacity and that, that, that by learning something new, that's going to help them later on because Yes, COVID might, might finish tomorrow, but the circumstances are going to happen again in a different form. So they have to be open and, and flexible in order to get feedback and to learn something new. This really goes directly to the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Business Curriculum, where they talk about skill set and mindset. The other thing they talk about is they talk about, obviously, you're worried about your business, there's the overall world, the marketplace, but then there's you. So there's you, your business, and the market. Pamela, this is a time that's tested all of us. We have literally been at, mm. at risk, and our families have been at risk, and many of us have lost, lost loved ones. And the survival of ourselves, our family, and our business has been ever-present. What minds like what does that require from a mindset perspective and i'm curious if as you guys shifted to online training over the last year you've had to maybe amp up a little the mindset training and the and the you part of the curriculum absolutely well thank you for that question dan and i think you know we've adapted the the curriculum has has stayed very much the same we've we've been committed to delivering the curriculum online and it's been a wonderful experience um our team has done a 
terrific job. And our um, alumni or our scholars have responded positively to the online delivery of the program, which is great. Um, our first concern was, yes, but well, how will we establish that connection? And we've established it successfully through a, a lot of the online uh, techniques that we've all learned to uh, grow, uh, to adapt and to sort of own, if you will. Um, and so I think that has been that has been great. What's also been important is, is that we've focused a lot on building a sense of community. And I think that that's where it goes into um, speaking to the power of community and uh, entrepreneurship can feel like a very, very, very solitary experience. It should not be. And so what we always focus is on is on establishing sort of that mindset of you as a business owner, as an entrepreneur are not alone. We are here to be of support to you, um, our faculty, our business advisors and our greater alumni community. Mm -hmm. as well as our partners. But um, I think that um, it's, it's really important. I think if anything, this time has really given everybody the opportunity to say, how can I as an individual be of support? And we've seen so many, so many terrific examples of that. Alumni communicating with alumni who, uh, you know, maybe one of them wasn't as well-versed in e-commerce, but the other one was. Um, you know, a lot of exchange of information, a lot of sharing. And so that's been that's been something very, very nice. And it's something that speaks that we speak to the that that our curriculum speaks to, that it's not just about the business aspect. It's about the individual's ability uh, and opportunity to really grow as an entrepreneur and to give back. So thank you for that question, Dan. Yeah. You know, at BizHack, when we think about how we deliver our curriculum, we have three C's. We call it content, coaching, and community. And I actually, in many ways, believe that the community pillar, that third C, is more essential than ever, especially during COVID. We used WhatsApp to have like an internal chat, and it just exploded in use. I mean, we just saw a hunger and a need for human connection digitally intervened. And it's interesting because we teach marketing. And the way I like to think about marketing is basically, how do you take your human-to-human uh, -human connection and spread it to the more people in a more, in a more scalable and systematic way? And that's really what digital marketing is, is getting the human-to-human, -human, but through the intermediation of social media or email or live webinars like this. Uh, we can touch a lot more people uh, in a much more efficient way. And we've seen that community piece similarly just explode as a result. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to invite our uh, folks who are watching to hit the Q&A button if you have any questions for the panelists. If there's a specific panelist you want to ask a question to, now is your opportunity. Uh, we have a, a bunch of great questions, but your questions are always better than mine. So please do feel free to, to throw any questions you might have into the Q&A uh, for any of our panelists. So the Federal Reserve just did a study, and that study said that three out of 10 businesses self-reported that they're at risk in, of closing in 2010. A lot of these businesses have just been like hanging on by their fingernails and they don't really see a path forward. If you could give just, and I know this is a really difficult question, so I'm kind of intentionally giving you an impossible question answer, but if you had like one piece of advice for a business owner that comes to you and says, you know, Michael, Gustavo, Fabiana, I don't know if I can make it. I don't know if I can make it. Um, what would be your piece of advice? And, and I know this is kind of a difficult question. Um, and so I'm going to start with you, Gustavo. Uh, so I'll give you the first chance. What would be um, either the first question you ask or the first or the piece of advice you might give to someone who's at risk? So the first thing will be to speak with their partners and not necessarily has to be with business partners, but also family um to to for everyone to understand what's the situation they're in um and that way develop some level of support and empathy um then with make sure to to speak with business the business partners in order to identify what's the financial situation um based in in their finance and, and how long they can go for how much time speak with the team right speak with the team in terms of what they can do together based on the current situation of the company in order to um either 
expand as much as possible the the the, the resistance that they need in order to be able to survive this crisis. Uh, but also, what are some of the adjustments and sacrifices that each member of the team has to make in order to be able to to make it financially? So that that's perfect. So, so really, to, to to check with their partners, both business partners and their family network, about what changes, what sacrifices would need to happen to help you continue. Michael, you're up. What would be your piece of advice or what question would you ask if someone came to you like that? I think the first thing to do is to to assess what the the worst case scenario is. And once you know what the worst case scenario is, then you stop stressing and worrying about everything and then you can focus on your business. But the problem is when you're in that situation, you spend way too much time stressing and not thinking thinking about the worst case scenario. Um, and uh, so you, you understand what it is, you come to grips with it, and then you work off of that. And I love that advice because us entrepreneurs, us sort of crazy business owners, us startup founders, we tend to think in best case scenarios. And so when you're at, uh, when you when you think through and plan for a worst case scenario, it makes you much more ready for the worst and resilient. Fabiana, same question. What one piece of advice would you give to a business owner who's at risk? I agree with Michael because when we are in normal times, everybody needs $50,000, $100,000 in a business loan. Nobody needs the $5,000. That maybe is the money that they need just to update the computer. That's it. So it will be good to ask uh, the entrepreneur if they were able in this situation request the bridge loan, the PPPs, all the CARES Act money that they are there, still there just to apply for some kind of, you know, sabotage. And then I will invest in marketing. I don't know why our entrepreneurs, they do not consider that marketing is key because I could have a good product, but if nobody knows my product and the first thing that we are doing when we know a name of a business, we Google the business, we try to get information. So I need for my entrepreneurs here in Florida to revise the business plan as well. So that is something that it will be giving us the key and the answer why my business is not successful. And if I have to close door, Close door in the best way possible. Do not leave anything out there with a balance or whatever, because life is a cycle. Maybe you are going to reopen a business and that issue is going to pop up again. You know, I just may jump in, Dan. Fabi, that's an excellent point, because what's going to happen is just like we saw with the uh, Lehman Brother collapse in 08, 07, nobody took, no, if you had to close during that time period, nobody held held that looked at you uh, uh, scams. That, that was, uh, it was understandable. It, 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 and, and that's going to happen with this. And so closing out, settling everything. So you're ready to, with that next idea, the next move. Um, great point, Bob. Sorry to cut in there. No, no. I, I thought that was a great point that like, there's no shame in closing down, but do it honorably, do it with an eye towards the next business you're going to start. Brian, same question. What piece of advice would you give to a business that is not sure it's going to survive? Well, I had two pieces of advice. I think a lot of the folks already talked about kind of understanding your financial situation. From SBDC, we always says embrace your numbers, understand your numbers. It goes the same for business growth. Can't grow if you don't understand the financial situation of your business and kind of understand what's going on. It's even more important during a disaster. Um, if you're going to be seeking funds, you need to know how much you're going to need, how much you're going to use, what are you going to put it towards? Can you stock some like on the side so you maybe don't can pay off other debts that are coming up sooner? So that one. The second thing is um, my background, I'm a disaster guy, disaster preparedness, business continuity. I wish it didn't come in handy. I wish we didn't have hurricanes and Zika and pandemics. Um, but the biggest thing we always stress for business continuity and recovery is to kind of come up with a very small actionable list. Because like if you're going to climb a mountain, you're not going to look at the top of the mountain. You're going to look at the path at the bottom and just kind of take step by step by step. So we always recommend for businesses in terms of business continuity of preparation, but also recovery is focus on kind of what are the three immediate things that you need to do. Kind of focus on that actionable list, work down the list, then come up with three additional things. Because like Michael said, you're going to overthink it. You're going to think I have to do 50 things and I have to do this. And you got to start somewhere. So I would say kind of start with a, a plan and focus on just three kind of core things you need to do. We always say for business, what are your core services? What's your core operations? What are critical? Like that's going to shut down. There's a lot of things you could focus on, but kind of what's going to keep you up and running. That's the most important thing to focus on. And uh, I'll go to you in a second, Pamela, but just to kind of build on that idea, 
if you've been in business for any amount of time, you have what's known as a product market fit, which means you're selling a product or service to people who are willing buyers. And that is the foundation of any company. And that is the place to start is look at what your offering is that has a proven market and invite uh, and, and start from that core. Pamela, if someone is at risk, what advice would you give to them? I would um, I would agree with all of the recommendations given thus far, but I would really focus, I would help the individual focus on big picture as much as possible. I would help them understand what options there are uh, because there always are options. And I would really try to um, be a point of support, neutral support uh, that he or she may not have in their, in their space. Um, I think that sometimes uh, speaking to someone that is not part of your business, but understands the needs of your business is important um, so that you have a um, an outside perspective. Uh, sometimes having somebody that's completely not related to your business, but that can speak about, hey, these are your options, or have you considered looking at it, looking at it this way? Um, you know, it's tough. We know that we know that businesses and small businesses uh, alike have had to make some really tough decisions. Um, but I, we, I always think that there's an opportunity to, um, to look at what, what does this mean? What does this big shift mean? Or what's the risk? And what options are there from that risk that I can grow from or that I can adapt? Um, and so I think that that's, I would, I would highly, highly recommend and try to be available for that person to sort of understand and help them find uh, options that they should consider. Yeah, it's beautiful because it kind of really goes full circle with what Gustavo was saying. He's like, you know, check with your family, check with your business partners and, and team, and then check with outside mentors and advisors uh, who are going to help you um, get a less frantic, less hysterical perspective on what's going on. Michael was talking about planning for the worst and the worst is shutting down. And Fabiana talked about how to do that with grace. Um, and then, um, you know, and Brian said, focus on the top three things in your core and the three things you can do now to help you, um, you know, transition and pivot to a world in which you can't do business face to face. We've gotten the same question from two different folks, and it's the beautiful question. Ross Can, a 10KSB alumnus, and Audrey Salazar, uh, who uh, both of them have also been part of the BizHack program, are essentially asking the same question, which I'll invite all of you to answer. What changes during COVID are permanent? Uh, Audrey wrote, "Is what is the new normal going to look like after the everyone's vaccinated and, and the pandemic is in the rearview mirror?" Um, and um, just in 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 unfair fairness, I'm going to start with you, Pamela, and go in reverse order. Okay, no problem. Well, listen, I think. Um, the new normal is to be defined by each company, but I think that something that is a key takeaway is, is that we will all come uh, together knowing how important that power of connection is. Um, and I think that that's probably going to be, I think there's an there's a heightened, and I think it's a gift. If there is something to, to be said, you know, there, there's a gift um, from this whole pandemic that we've had is that how important it is to really truly be connected and to build your community and to build on your community. Um, so I think that that's going to be something that we will all be able to, um, to really embrace and build on. Uh, that sense of heightened um, intention and, and conscientiousness um, and, and creativity. So I think that that's going to be something that's going to stay in. And that's frankly, one of the things that encourages me the most uh, because that's all things that add and that help um, us as, as uh, advisors or as uh, resources to small businesses and certainly to entrepreneurs. So I, I almost hear like a much more motivated business owner, someone who's not willing or able to just ride on, you know, uh, ride on cruise control. Uh, Brian, how about you? What, what do you think is the new normal for business? Well, kind of like Pamela, I'd give myself an out and basically say it depends on your industry. Um, cause I think different industries, there are things, if you talk about restaurants, you know, there's a lot more people using Uber Eats and Grubhub and things like that than probably pre COVID. Um, like a lot of the marketing that they did and things like that. 
the one thing I would kind of agree with Pamela was about the community aspect, because a lot of us were very more focused on kind of like our families, kind of our homes, um, also in terms of like supporting local businesses. And so I think a lot of businesses were able to basically establish that connection with the community. An example I would give you is Rio Cristal. It's over on Bird, um, kind of in Westchester. You know, it's a very long-standing Cuban restaurant, like gives you a mountain of French fries on top of a steak. Um, I'm partial to it because it's near my house, but that's a longtime family-owned business. And they announced that they were gonna close because the previous owner, the dad, didn't take on debt. For the, um, the children, they didn't wanna take on additional debt to keep the business open. And they announced that they were gonna be closing. The community like rallied and basically went and supported the business and they were able to keep the business open um, by the support from the community. And I really was kind of touched by that because that really was a business that kind of got shown by the community that like we value your business, we support your business, we want to help you. And that multiply that story times all the local businesses that really did digital marketing, kind of like grassroots outreach, Kind of did try to connect with the community and it, it crosses industries in terms of retail restaurants professional services you know other types of businesses like that um, so i would say it really goes back to you telling your story and kind of understanding like the fundamentals of your business because um, you could really make those connections and i think those connections will kind of outlive COVID. you know above my shoulder you see it says stronger together and that's really what we mean when we talk about this what we have noticed is while you know, big companies have really benefited, uh, particularly big tech. Uh, you know, the, the move to buying everything online um, has, uh, you know, an incredible uh, increase in revenue that Amazon and others have seen has been paired, I think, with a much more acute appreciation for the personality and spice of Main Street that's provided by small businesses and how diminished our communities would be without them um, and that we are willing to to vote with our dollars to make sure that these amazing small businesses that really give the character to our community are supported I I think if you're good as a small business at telling your story as you said Brian uh, why you do what you do the way that you do it differently than anyone else and the and the love and the heart that you put into it you're much, much more likely to, to survive this. And I think people are really understand that small businesses are endangered and are primed to help you if you make it easy for them to help. And in many ways, the way I think about digital marketing is it's about getting your business story out into the community and then making it as easy as possible for them to do business with you in a convenient way. And if you can do that, I think there's a path to survival for, for many businesses. Um, Fabiana, um, same question. What is the new normal for business, in your opinion? Yes, I was thinking exactly the same, that right now, as a customer myself, I'm thinking twice where I'm putting my money when I have to buy a product. If uh, this is something that is going to affect my community, if this is a green product, if the fare for the employees is fair, uh, if the payment for the employees is fair. So I'm thinking twice right now. So as customer, we are going to be more uh, prepared to invest in our community. And also for the business owner, we need to understand that the situation will be completely different. If before the pandemic, we were saying that probably most of us, we have only one month in order to survive as a saving. And this is something that is going to be an issue for the future. So when some of our business owners, they are going to request access to capital, we need to understand that the situation will be different. There's not going to be more uh, PPP, there's not going to be more uh, disaster loan. Um, so we need to understand that they are going to review how we were performing before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and how we are prepared after the pandemic. So we need to be working harder, I guess, than before. Perfect. Michael, the new normal, anything that you would observe? Well, I think uh, as a small business owner, you have to see how the new normal is going to affect your customers. And so if you're in a high density area where the, you relied historically on, on uh, businesses that gathered there, you need to accept the fact that businesses are going to be more uh, virtual, uh, less people are going to be going around and you have to adapt. So you have to, whatever your industry is, there are you know, whether it's 
you know, people growing beards like Gustavo and I, or, or casual wear, um, you know, it, it, there are certain things that are going to carry on. And I think you need to look at how it affects your, cu how your customer base is affected. Um, Absolutely. Um, Gustavo, same question, new normal, anything that you think is going to be a permanent change? I think regardless of the industry or the size, um, the embracement, uh, the embracing technology, using the technology in order to be able to collect that data, they will give us the insights, right? To create that story, to understand who are we talking to from the point of sale, how we collect data from the credit card in order to understand who is this person, where did they live, uh, but also what's their behavior and how often they come in order to create maybe loyalty programs and so on and how to speak to them through different channels, not only digital marketing, but how we combine the digital with the physical. I think that it, what we call evidence-based methodologies um, and the ability to pivot, something that Michael mentioned, it's something just like Darwin, right? It's not the fastest, the, the strongest or the smartest that survives, but the one that who is able to adapt, that is able to thrive. So that is something that is going to remain in, in the minds of the small business owners. And I would just add one thing. I think the move towards remote workplaces and the diminished need for business travel is a permanent change. We have learned over the last year that we don't need to be traveling so much and we don't need to be doing quite so much in person in order to be able to be successful with our business. And um, I think that that's uh, actually appeals to a lot of people. They're avoiding having to commute. Um, a number of the panelists look like they might be doing this from their home. Um, you know, you can be successful, uh, me too, uh, for, you know, in your business um, remotely. Uh, I think it will create new challenges as well about um, you know, like the webinars, there's webinar fatigue, um, you know, people definitely uh, get, get tired uh, of doing business remotely. Um, teams and managing teams that are remote teams and keeping them motivated and staying in touch, those are going to be challenges that new businesses and industries are going to emerge from. So I think, you know, Michael's point, I think, is probably the most important, which is look at what your customer's new normal is going to be talk to them, observe them, get intimate with them, and then make sure that your business is adapting to meet their changing needs. Um, and, you know, from a digital marketing perspective, we saw an explosion in email readership, in um, use of laptops versus mobile. For the first time in a long time, we saw that laptops were almost equally used as mobile. Um, all of this has big impacts in, in, in digital marketing, but we, we, we saw a lot of usage uh, in evenings and weekends uh, that we didn't used to see. And those patterns have started to shift. So it, it's really kind of a day-by-day, week-by-week thing, when it, certainly when it comes to digital marketing. And you just need to be constantly attuned to the shifts um, in order for you to be able to serve your customer best. And starting by looking at where your customer is and what they need uh, in terms of both their communication needs and in terms of the product is where you are going to adapt and survive. So I wanted to ask um, a question about minority businesses because so many of you guys, so many of us are minority serving organizations. I know 87% of BizHack's participants are minorities and 70% are women. Um, we also know that COVID has disproportionately impacted uh, black owned businesses, other minority businesses, and of course, uh, women. Uh, we're probably back by a decade in terms of, we reached, uh, equality in the marketplace in like January, February, and now we're back a decade. So many women have had to retreat from the workforce due to childcare issues related to COVID and homeschooling. So I know this is an issue that we could spend a long time on, but several of your organizations are specifically committed to minority serving, uh, specifically Miami Bayside uh, and Ascenda. So Michael, starting with you, um, how do we need to overperform and do better to serve our minority-owned businesses? I, I think what we found with Rise is not that there's not enough programs out there, but that the people that we're trying to reach are not hearing, the, hearing us. And so it's really about how do, we, how do we get to them? Because obviously you've got the, the people that are attending this are savvy. They, they're, they're trying to learn. They're um, constantly looking at things. But many of the entrepreneurs that you're referring to are – one mom and pop shops, one man, one person running everything. They don't have the time to step away from their business and think of, uh, they're constantly 
in their business, not stepping away and thinking about their business. Um, and therefore, they're ignoring the emails because they're just fires left and right that they have to put out, especially in this time of COVID. Um, so we as, a, as an eco, ecosystem need to figure out how to better reach those people. And one of the things we found with Rise was uh, the old, old, old standby of knocking on doors and having a street team out there was really what drove a lot of the small businesses that we were trying to reach to finally say, oh, yeah, I now I'll, now I'll participate or I'll, I'm, yes, I need the money. You know, I, I want to underscore that point. My wife is the CEO of Catalyst Miami, which is a social justice organization, and they've gone into microenterprise support because they did a study of one of their areas uh, of, 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 of service, which is North Miami, and 90%, 90% of small business owners in North Miami had not availed themselves of any of our resources. And that's a marketing problem. That's a communication issue. We are clearly not communicating with the people who need us the most. And that's something that organizations like my wife, who have longstanding relationships, are able to help bridge because they have those lines of communication. And I think partnering with organizations that are non-traditional, my wife has never, Catalyst Miami has never been involved in small business support before, but they just saw that need and that a lot of us just aren't reaching them. Uh, and I, I want to uh, ask Fabiana, specifically with the Spanish speaking community, um, have you observed uh, how can we better serve them? Yes, I feel the same, that they are uh, left behind. Um, there are a lot of people that um, they don't understand probably their situation if they have a work visa, an asylum. So there are a lot of many things that we could do. What is the issue? Like you said, Dan, we need to build some kind of trust as well, because remember these type of communities, they are always, you know, probably, I don't know, they are... Um, they are taking their good faith, or they are taking their money in good faith, or they are charging, and there are a lot of resources that they are, you know, for example, this amazing webinar, this free conversation that we have today with open question and answer. So um, I guess that our community should be doing more in order to penetrate these minority areas, because they are really very, like, close, and they do not trust. What happened with the PPP, when they open up PPP with their banks, they were saying, hey, I have your personal account, but since you don't have the credit card with me, I cannot do the PPP for you. Or since you don't have the business account with me, I cannot do the PPP. So these are the people that they feel that they were, you know, being used by the system, and we need to make them understand that there is other ways to get into the system. Yeah, and I was going to say, Michael, one of the takeaways from of the pandemic was also the importance of CDFIs like Michael and Fabiana, and also um, credit unions, minority depository institutions. Because um, for our center, we're really proud that the 95 million in capital, 68 million of that went to minority owned businesses or woman owned businesses. But I would tell you, minority businesses definitely struggled to access a lot of the federal resources because the programs were changing, the eligibility initially was a lot of big businesses getting access to the funds and not really small businesses. Um, so I think the and for the uh, recent rounds, they've opened it up for like a week or two weeks, but you're not making up for the fact that they didn't get the loans last year. So I think that that's a real struggle. And it, it is something from a lot of the organizations. We definitely have a lot of good connections in the community. And like Fabiana said, it is a, a lot of working with groups that are in the community and kind of like recognizing that there's a lot we can do, but there's a lot they can do and trying to find that synergy and kind of like not replicating what other folks are doing. So. As usual, I agree with Fabiana. You know, all of us are essentially in the information business, right? And the, la, la des desigualidad informatico is a huge problem. The inequality of information and access to information, which is particularly acute among non-English speakers, minorities, immigrants, even women. And that is something all of us amongst our groups and those of you listening in can do better. So looking for ways in which we can help bridge those divides, speaking in each other's languages and doing specific outreach and partnering with organizations that specialize in servicing those communities. Because I really do think, I mean, one of the big premises of BizHack is that 
the same tools that are available to Fortune 500 companies are available to you as a small business. Facebook Business Manager, Google Ads, these are the same tools that the largest companies in the world are using and you can for free access those tools, but do you know how to use them effectively? That's not necessarily the case. And so our contribution is to try to help bridge that, that, that informational divide. And I think in many ways, all of us really are in the business of bridging informational divides that are stopping people from being able to access capital, stopping people from being able to hire the right people, stopping people from being able to effectively market themselves, stopping people from being able to tell their story. If only people heard your story, that you they would do business with you. But they're home, they're stuck, they need to hear from you digitally, otherwise they don't know you're there and they've forgotten about you. And by the time we wake up and we look out, our main streets are hollowed out. And then they're gonna be filled up with Chipotle's and Benihana's and chains. No, no offense to, to the subways of the world, but we want our local businesses. We need you, our local businesses, and we're here to help you survive this. You're not alone, but you need to know where to look and how to access that. And we need to do a better job of getting to them. Um, I wanted to wrap up now with a couple lightning round questions. And hopefully you guys are ready for these because I gave them to you ahead of time. So uh, kind of a couple word answers for each of these, uh, starting with you, Gustavo. What is a book, a podcast, uh, and or a website that you'd recommend to a small business owner? Oh, I have the book here. It's called Tra Traffic Secrets. Um, I'm trying to learn about customer journey and how to get better with digital marketing. It's really a book that gives you a lot of tactics and practical it, it tips in order to how to build this. So I strongly recommend it, especially if you want to complement with uh, uh, an academy like BizHack. So that's the book that I recommend. Russell Brunson has really built a beautiful system for marketing called Marketing Funnels. Highly recommend it. Brian. I was going to say a good one is HBR IdeaCast. Um, they have really good weekly um, ones they've talked a lot about, like recruiting during COVID, managing remote workforces. Um, it's had a lot of good information. Normally it's good, but it's been really good during COVID too. HBR is Harvard Business Review. Fabiana. Uh, well, you know, I don't have the um, authority to recommend any book at all, but anyway, I like for my entrepreneurs to, to do yoga, to try to think uh, with their mind uh, peacefully, something that it could be very good for them if they could cook or do something in the community as well is good. So whatever is going to fit their soul, it will be my recommendation. Yeah, self-care has never been more important. Michael? Uh, it's an old one. It's a classic with a horrible title. It's how to, how to uh, six, oh, shoot, uh, now I'm drawing a blank on them. Um, how to, not how to succeed in business. Uh, oh, how to, how to win friends and influence people. Sorry, peeps. Um, but it's an old classic, <laughs> horrible title. Uh, but great uh, uh, on customer service and on um, just and sales. Dale Excellent. Dale, yeah. Dale Carnegie. Dale Carnegie. Uh, Pamela. Okay, so my recommendation would be twofold. I'll cheat. I'll give two two answers. Number one, I would recommend that all of us, um, all small business entrepreneurs and all of us really embrace um, the outdoors. You know, there are so many wonderful opportunities to visit and get to know communities in our own backyard. Um, whether that means going to Vizcaya, you know, on the day that it's free, open to the public, uh, whether that means going for a walk, um, you know, in little Haiti, whether that means, you know, visiting, uh, the design district, whatever it may be, just really embrace and visit a part of the community. The, the Redlands, Homestead, you know, go out into the farms and see. That's one thing. Um, number two, in terms of um, websites that I would recommend, and Dan, thank you for bringing up the, you know, the important point about, about localizing our, our presence. Um, I think it's so important. Uh, it really is, because it's important to be able to reach out and connect with, with members across our community, okay? And so one, I would recommend that folks visit, small business entrepreneurs visit bizhelp.miami. 
this is a portal that was developed by the by the Beacon Council and by uh, several other organizations, and it's a great portal where there's information about funding and grants and you know programs, including all of ours, by the way. So it's all there. And then secondly, I would recommend that folks visit mdc.edu. Uh, this isn't a self-serving mes uh, message. It's more because I think that small business entrepreneurs really need to take a look at opportunities for upskilling you know, or for maybe a certification of some sort um, for themselves or for their own staff. I think these are all very, and there are, whether it's MDC or FIU or Barry University, whomever, just go and see that there are opportunities out there um, for programs uh, like all of ours, or um, certainly, you know, academic uh, programs that are available. And, um, the, the best best thing I think we've seen is that our, we have an elevated sense of community, going back to what I was saying before. So those, those are the ones that I would recommend. Thanks, Jan. I love it. Re feed your mind and feed your body, feed your soul. Um, I'm gonna share a book recommendation that has been very meaningful to me. It's called Traction. Um, this is uh, an operating system for a business that dramatically simplifies the the operation of running a business and getting everybody aligned with the same goals. Um, and it's been very, very meaningful and helpful to me um, as a business owner to kind of get organized and channel, you know, my prodigious energy in the same direction and not drive my staff crazy in the meantime. So um, Traction, uh, it's called the Entrepreneurial Operating System, and there's a whole ecosystem around it of practitioners. Uh, it's been a very important part of my last year uh, and, and how I'm trying to take BizHack to the next level. Um, we talked about bizhelp.miami, um, which is a great segue to the last question, last lightning round before we wrap up. And thank you guys for sticking around a little, a few extra minutes. bizhelp.miami is a, a kind of a first attempt uh, by the Beacon Council to assemble all of the incredible resources in our entrepreneurial ecosystem into a single place so that people can go at a kind of one-stop shop and look for help. You know, obviously there's a lot of marketing that needs to be done to let people know that this resource exists, but bizhelp.miami is a fabulous starting point. And it, it you know, I think all of us, including myself, uh, BizHack, are, are partners to bizhelp.miami. And, um, one of the, the the foundational elements, challenges, I would say, about the South Florida and particularly about Miami-Dade County is we all seem to be operating in bubbles and, it, and we don't do a good job as a community in cohering and working together and overlapping. And it's so encouraging, frankly, to see how Michael and Fabiana uh, partnered on the RISE program. I know that uh, Bayside and SBDC, Michael and Brian have also partnered on digital marketing training. You know, the scale up program that Gustavo runs is really a feeder program for the 10 KSB program. So th just amongst ourselves, um, you know, I, I'm a, an instructor in a number of your programs, like just amongst ourselves, we are doing things, but I think there's a lot more that we need to do to build that ecosystem that we keep talking about. So last question, and uh, Pamela, you kind of answered this already, so I'm going to skip you for this one, is what is one, yours was bizhelp.miami, what is one resource that's not owned by you guys, that's not your own, that you would recommend to help businesses, uh, whether they're in South Florida or, or outside of South Florida? And I'll start with you, Fabiana. What's one website or resource that you would recommend to a small business owner? Um, I'm always saying that if they are coming to Ascendus, I have to give um, the individual, the business owner, some kind of solution, uh, plan B, if I cannot help. Most of the time I'm referring them to a partner organization that I know that they are going to take care of my um, customer, my client, my lead, whatever you want to call this individual. And I work really very well with Miami Bayside Foundation. I send them to uh, Brian's team because they are amazing. Uh, here in Broward to a score Broward that is another resource. If they are, I'm promoting always, you know, um, Goldman Sachs for the people that they are in certain level of, uh, so uh, we know each other. Um, the idea center is for those that they are in the one or two years of, um, you know, uh, in business, time in business. So 
there's no magic prospera, it could be. So I'm trying always to provide depending on the need. Um, sometimes it's housing. I have to provide some kind of, you know, guidance in reference of housing. So legal advice that we, since we are not lawyers or maybe we are not accountants, we need to provide the organization that they could do that for free. If I were to have had a sixth panelist, it would have been Prospera. Um, and, you know, they're, they're another organization that's very aligned with the, the five of us uh, or the six of us in terms of the kinds of services that they provide. Um, same question to you, Gustavo. Uh, what is one resource that you would recommend to a small business that's not your own? So, yeah, I think piggyback with what Fabiana said, we work very close to each other. So we know pretty well the ecosystem and we know how to refer. Um, and we, I guess, center, we specialize on those that are in the initial stages of the, 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 the idea or the business. So there's one website that is the Y Combinator. It's an accelerator and also uh, uh, an incubator that invests in startups. And it has a, a ton of resources from... Uh, videos about pitch competitions, about legal documents or templates that, in order to build NDAs or agreements with investors. So the Y Combinator is strongly recommended to anyone that is thinking of starting a new idea. Um, and at the same time, the, the beauty of, of these organizations, Fabiana, uh, I met Fabiana through Prospera and I'm a former business consultant for them, is that we collaborate among each other. So um, really, I recommend the Y Combinator for any type of early stage um, businesses or ideas that you want to develop. Beautiful. Brian, you recommended uh, accesshelps.org. Is there anything you want to say about what that resource is for? No, I would just reiterate, like, recommend, fully recommend all the resources on this panel. Also, shout out to Mirna and Prospera. They're a good partner for us. Um, I did mention two, basically, resources. One was Miami Eats which is under the Convention and Visitors Bureau, where if you want to find local businesses that you can go eat at, like Pamela said, you want to get outside, you want to go support local business, it's a good site. Um, also, basically, Access Helps is under the Urban Impact Lab, and it is kind of like similar to BizHelp, where it's basically kind of like a catch-all for a lot of resources, and you can go in there and kind of put in some information about your business, and it'll tell you about different resources. Prospera is there, SBDC is there, a lot of other groups are there as well. Um, so it's a really good resource for local businesses. Wonderful. Michael, last but not least, take us home. What's a resource that you would recommend? Brian. No, but all kidding aside. All kidding Thanks, aside we're recording uh, this, right? We're recording this? No, but all kidding aside, the SBA, uh, which supports the SBDC and SCORE, um, our free programs, uh, SCORE is more mentor-driven. Uh, the SBDC is more coach-driven, but it's those, those programs are throughout the country. So I think we have somebody from Newport, Rhode Island, you know, there's programs up there that he can access that are similar to the quality of what Brian and his team bring to the table. Great recommendation. SCORE is, I believe, made up from, you know, uh, older folks who've had careers in business who want to give back by mentoring companies. It's free. You can get legal help. It's, it's an incredible resource. They do a lot of free trainings as well. Um, my resource is smallbusiness.withgoogle.com. Google by far, when you look at big tech, has done more than anyone else to support small businesses with free, high quality resources. And your entry point in that is that website I put in the group in the chat, smallbusiness.withgoogle.com. We have moved to a digital world. It's, it's, it's there, we're there, it's accelerated due to COVID and Google is doing a lot uh, to, to help with that. Um, they have business interests behind it. You always have to remember that. Their, their ad product, which is you know Google Ads, which go with search and on YouTube, uh, are benefited from all the small businesses that are digitally savvy and looking to reach new customers. So it's not without with pure altruistic uh, means, but they are really looking to build out their small business support and education and training, and you should take advantage of it because it's free. Um, I want to tell you guys how grateful I am to the work that you do on behalf of our community, on behalf of our small businesses. I I'm humbled in the ways that I'm able to partner with you, and I want you to know that I'm completely aligned and in support uh, of, of everything you're doing to make this community survive and thrive. South Florida in particular, 
our lifeblood is the small business. We don't have a lot of Fortune 500 companies. We don't have a lot of big industry. And these small businesses are what really make possible the American dream uh, of the 70% of our foreign born residents in Miami-Dade County having a chance to, to, to make it and you guys are helping them get there. So thank you on behalf of all small businesses uh, for your time today and for your expertise. This will be uh, posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, it's right now streaming live across YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. And uh, really encourage those of you who are here, it was a small but mighty group, uh, to please share this with your networks. There's a ton of great information. You'll also get a follow-up email from us with the resources uh, that were mentioned. Um, I did wanna quickly give you guys a quick heads up uh, about what's coming up in the next three weeks as part of this free webinar series. Uh, we call it BizHack Live. We uh, created it uh, due to COVID and it's been now a year and more than four, this is our 44th free weekly seminar that we've done. Um, and I gotta say, we do this from a, from a philosophy of abundance. Our belief at BizHack, my belief, is that the more you give, the more you receive. And so the, the, the goal with these webinars and by creating a platform for these amazing thought leaders is to help you. And if we help you, we're achieving our mission. So coming up next week, um, we're gonna be talking about the agile mindset for business. The agile methodology is one that came out of Toyota and manufacturing and then was adopted as the primary way that software is now built. And what we're starting to see is this agile methodology is being adopted by businesses outside of technology and manufacturing to extraordinary effect. Uh, Brenda Kwateng is a expert in helping businesses use agile inside of their businesses. And Brett Searcy at Starmark has applied this inside of their agency uh, and were featured in the Wall Street Journal for the work they did. I'm very excited uh, about how we can apply some of the best technology practices to your business. The week after that, we're gonna have Foursquare and their head of data and insights. Foursquare, you might remember, is that geolocation app. Well, they've really converted into a company that focuses on targeted geographic data and how small businesses and other businesses can leverage that for their marketing. And it's a huge part of digital marketing. It's a huge part of the future of any business. And then finally, um, in three weeks from now, uh, we're gonna have Ed Delia uh, of Delia Associates talking about the power of your brand. That's really about what Brian was saying, your business story and how you get it out there and, and uh, how you can use that to uh, propel your business forward. Um, we do offer a season pass. If you want to sign up for all of our amazing speakers in season three, we have it all the way through the end of June. Uh, and uh, with that, I just want to say, join us here next week at 1230. And thank you, Gustavo, Michael, Fabiana, Brian, and Pamela for all that you do for our community. Be safe. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to the panelists. Have a good week. Have thank a good you. one, everybody. Take care, Dutch. Take care everybody. everybody. Thank you, Dan. Take thank care. you, guys. Thank, thank you for you everything you do. Take care. Bye-bye.